Good afternoon. I'm David Ferriero. I'm the Archivist of the United States, and it's a pleasure to welcome you this afternoon to the William G. McGowan Theater here at the National Archives. Welcome to our friends who are joining us on YouTube, and a special welcome to our C-SPAN audience. A century ago, the First World War was raging in Europe, but the United States was not yet involved, and there was strong sentiment throughout the land for us not to get involved. Eventually, we did in April 1917, and with gusto. And this afternoon, we'll learn how American doughboys, commanded by the leg legendary General John J. Pershing, brought the war to an end. But before we get to today's program, I'd tell you, like to tell you about a couple of programs coming up here in the McGowan Theater. This Thursday, March 24th at 7.30, we'll present the ninth annual McGowan Forum on Women in Leadership. This year's topic is from the computer age to the digital age and will be presented in partnership with the White House Office of Science and Technology Policy. Megan Smith, United States Chief Technology Officer, will moderate a panel of experts. And this Friday on March 25th at noon, we'll observe the 100th anniversary of the National Park Service. We'll present a selection of short films from the National Archives motion picture holdings that give a glimpse of what several of the parks were like during the 1930s. From the vaults, the National Park Service on Film is presented in partnership with the 2016 Environmental Film Festival here in Washington. If you want to learn more about these and all of our public programs and exhibits, can consult our monthly calendar of events. There are copies in the lobby as well as sign-up sheets where you can receive it by regular mail or email, and you'll also find brochures about other National Archives programs and activities. Our guest speaker this afternoon, who just happens to be celebrating his birthday today, is Mitch Jockelson, investigative archivist with the National Archives, and is involved in our efforts to ensure that our records are safe, and should, the, should some go missing to help find them, and bring any thief or thieves to justice. He's a former professor of military history at the United States Naval Academy and currently teaches at Norwich University. For his work, he has received the Army Historical Foundation's Distinguished Writing Award. Mitch is also one of America's foremost experts on the First World War, and he holds a doctorate from the Royal Military College of Science at Cranfield University in the United Kingdom. Today, he will discuss and later answer your questions about his new book, 47 Days, How Pershing's Warriors Came of Age to Defeat the German Army in World War I. Douglas, Douglas Waller, the New York Times bestselling author of Disciples and Wild Bill Donovan, notes that Mitch is, has become a preeminent World War I historian. Commenting on the book, Waller has written with an absorbing narrative, fast pacing, and gritty detail. His 47 days brings to life that war's final and bloody Muse Argonne offensive when General John Blackjack Pershing and more than one million American and French soldiers broke the back of the mighty German army. Please welcome Mitch Jockelson. Good afternoon, everybody. It's a real pleasure to be here, and I'm really excited to see a nice crowd uh, to come out and, and hear a, a talk on um, a subject that doesn't get a lot of attention in the United States, and that's the United States effort in the First World War. As um, you know, Mr. Ferriero mentioned, uh, we got into the war in April of 1917 as our partner to the Allies and slowly built our forces until it uh, turned into the climactic battle of the Meuse-Argonne, which is um, the subject of my book and um, that my talk today. Uh, but the, the talk largely centers around General Pershing, and it is really his story, and that's kind of um, how I tell the, the, the battle, how it um, formed and how it played out and ultimately um, its um, success. 
So um, I'm often asked, you know, when did you begin writing this book? And, and one of my colleagues um, asked me out in the hall today, did you write this a few years ago and then wait to release it um, during the centennial? Uh, I, I wish I thought along those lines, but not really. I mean, part of the reason I was able to write a book like this is we are in the midst of the centennial of World War I and we'll be commemorating America's um, entrance next year and then its um, uh, participation as a combatant the following year. But um, in reality, the book started when I was a young man, and yes, that is a photo of me about age five. And it started because I used to go to a, um, a pediatrician in Silver Spring, Maryland, not far from here. And it wasn't one of the more pleasant experiences, not that I had any health issues to deal with. I would just get nervous. And I remember when my mom, who would take me in her Ford Fairlight, we'd turn on to Pershing Drive, which is near where his office was. I'd get this like chill, and I'd get this you know, weird feeling in my stomach, this nervousness. I mean, he was the nicest guy on the planet, don't get me wrong. And he'd you know, bribe me with artificial flavored lollipops to make sure my experience was good. But I started seeing this name Pershing, and, and I and it kind of stuck in the back of my mind. Who was he, and why is there a street name for him? And it didn't really become clear till I studied history in college, and then uh, got the fortune to work here at the National Archives, and for a number of years, I was our subject area specialist for the World War I record, so I got to see the documents that attributed to him that he often would write in the margins and, and uh, things that he wrote directly. And I got to know uh, a fair amount about him. And then when the idea to write a book about the Meuse-Argonne in, in a, a battle, as already mentioned, more than a million Americans plus assistance from the French, I realized it was more and more his story, and I was going to tell it um, through um, his words and what he wrote and what others wrote about him. So what I'd like to do to start out is in, in the event that you haven't read the book yet or you don't know a whole lot about General Pershing, um, we'll talk a little bit about him first and then about his warriors who fought under him and then about the battle itself. So... Um, General Pershing, uh, born 1860 in Laclede, uh, Missouri, which is about an hour and a half drive, two hours from Kansas City, right on the eve of the Civil War. He experienced his first um, so-called warfare during that time when guerrillas came through the town, uh, ransacked his father's house as a young, I'm sorry, his father's business, and as a young boy, he clung to his father, and through the help of his parents, they got through that tragedy. But he never really considered going in the military. It wasn't until he was a late teenager, he thought about a career as an attorney, as, an, as a teacher, but like a lot of um, people at that time, men only, the idea of a free education through uh, one of the service academies um, wasn't a bad idea. His sister saw an advertisement in the local newspaper for um, the examinations for the military academy. They were going to take place in his hometown. He took the entrance exam, passed it, and ended up going to West Point. He did so-so there academically, but he excelled as a leader. And a number of future um, officers who would serve under him during World War I were also classmates. And they knew that Pershing had this ability to lead men. He had that kind of charisma. Um, after graduating uh, West Point, he served um, out on the West in the frontier. And he was a, a company commander in the 10th US Cavalry, which is one of the all African American units formed after the Civil War. And did that, he went back, he taught in, um, in Nebraska, uh, through the University of Nebraska, through what we considered ROTC. But he went back and um, he taught at West Point, and he was a horrible instructor. Um, his, the cadets couldn't stand him, they made fun of him behind his back, and that's where the nickname of Blackjack came. It actually was uh, the stronger word, the N-word, but it was later softened to Blackjack, because they made fun of him because he had commanded these African-American troops, he ended up commanding them again during the Spanish-American War in the attack against um, the Spanish in uh, Cuba. And then later on went back and had a number of roles, including serving in the Philippines. He was an advisor during the Russo-Japanese War. And then 
Um, as he's kind of building his career, he meets a young woman in Washington, um, Frances Warren, who is the daughter of one of the high-ranking senators who also heads the military affairs. And he falls in love with her, and they get married. And lo and behold, he gets a promotion. He jumps from um, a lower rank to brigadier general. Many uh, question whether or not it's his association with uh, Senator Warren because of the fact that he was his father-in-law, that he, he leapt across um, so many others on the list who were also up for promotion. But, and, and there might be a little bit of truth to that, but I think the bottom line is Pershing had built up a strong experience as a leader and as a commander, and he deserved their promotion. They went and had a, a nice family of four children, three daughters and one son. They were living in the uh, Presidio in San Francisco in a home, and Pershing was called to the Mexican border in 1950. Tension was heating up between um, not so much the Mexican government, but um, uh, Americans who were living in Mexico. Mexico was under a, a revolution at the time, and, and the U.S. government vacillated between who we were going to support and so forth. And there were a, a number of troubles, a number of Americans who were murdered, and so it was a good idea to have American forces on the border. He moved down there in uh, the late summer of 1915. Um, Frankie, his wife, and their four children were to join him. And then one day in August, the telephone rang in his command, and his orderly wasn't there to answer it. So Pershing, frustrated, answered the phone, and he said, hello, who is it? And it was a reporter on the other end from one of the New York newspapers, not knowing that it was Pershing on the phone, said, I'm calling to verify the fire at the Pershing home. And there was this dead silence on the other end. And then Pershing said, what fire? I haven't heard about this. At that point, it was obvious to the reporter that he was talking to General Pershing at the time. Pershing told him, it is me. I need you to tell me what happened. The house, um, the previous evening, they were doing some renovation on it, and a fire broke out near a fireplace and engulfed the entire house. In addition to the Pershing family, there was another family also living in the home. They escaped the fire, but unfortunately, his wife and three of the four children, his three daughters, were killed in the fire. Only his son, Warren, survived. You can imagine how devastating this must have been to him. He traveled quickly back to San Francisco and uh, had to, of course, identify the remains, get the, the family um, uh, situation in order, and take care of his son, Warren. Um, he came back and, and served in, in the military, came back to the Army. A year later, Pancho Villa raids Columbus, New Mexico. President Wilson uh, authorizes an expeditionary force, a punitive expedition, as he called it, to go after Villa. Somebody had to lead it. Pershing was the obvious choice for a couple of reasons. One, he had the experience and as a leader, as a commander, and it was also thought, this guy is you know, in, a, in a bad place right now. He's very troubled about the loss of his, his family. We need to put him in a position of authority where he can get his mind off things. So he led the expedition um, into Mexico. It went on for a little over a year. The punitive expedition never captured Pancho Villa. It, he was, Villa was severely wounded in one fight. A number of his so-called Villistas uh, were killed. But ultimately, he got away for a number of reasons. Taking into 1917, the US finally gets into the war in, in April for a variety of reasons. And somebody needs to lead what's going to be the expeditionary force overseas. There were a number of other commanders that actually outranked Pershing, but nobody had the experience. And Secretary of War Baker suggested him. President Wilson agreed. And John J. Pershing now was going to lead the first large overseas contingent uh, of the United States. And as I talk about in the book, he takes the Americans into the modern age. And what he's got at his disposal are a small group of American soldiers. There's roughly 127,000 regulars, the professional soldiers. There's about 110,000 National Guard. Many of those have been called up on the Mexican border to protect the border against further incursions. 
Uh, they were federalized by President Wilson. Plus, Wilson authorized a, a draft a conscription. There were end up being three conscriptions throughout uh, World War I, including the drafted soldiers plus uh, volunteers. There were roughly about two million, um, over two million, who were either drafted or volunteered. But the regular troops were. They had experience, but not the type of experience one was going to need for, to fight a modern warfare overseas, especially on the Western Front. And if any of you have ever been to the battlefields in France and in Belgium, you know that the remnants are still there of the trenches, of the machine gun nests, and just the difficult terrain that uh, the troops had to fight over. It's three years into the war. The British have been badly bloodied in battles like the Somme, where more than 60,000 British troops are either killed or wounded on the first day, July 1st, 1916. The French had been bloodied um, in, in Verdun, and American troops were badly needed. The question, though, among the Allies was, why don't you bring these American troops over here and we'll join forces with the French and the British. We'll amalgamate them, as the term term went. Well, President Wilson knew that eventually this war is going to come to an end and that the Americans are going to need to have a say at the peace table. The only way they're going to have a legitimate say is to have an independent American army. So he gives Pershing his instructions, you will form your first, uh, your army independently and fight independently. Now, the Americans had very little training we had very few guns. We certainly didn't have the big guns, the artillery. We didn't have aircraft and a number of other supplies. So we relied heavily on the French and the British. Many of our troops um, trained with both the British and, uh, Expeditionary Force and the French Army. But when it came to about a year into the US being involved in the war, and more and more American troops are coming over, Pershing pushed to form what he would call First Army, the First American Army. And so he met with this gentleman here, um, Ferdinand Foch, Marshal Foch, who was head of all the Allied armies. Foch wasn't real excited about Pershing having his independent force, and they dickered back and forth. Um, they had a number of very difficult meetings, um, almost came to blows, and I go into discussion about this in the book. But Pershing was adamant about forming his first army and fighting as in their own front. And he selected an area that had been under German control since about September of 1914 when the war had was uh, just commenced. And that's the area between the Meuse River and the Argonne Forest. Um, Foch was not real happy about this, but he allowed Pershing to form this. Meanwhile, Pershing had come up with an idea of attacking another area not far from there, a salient that had its base in the, um, the town of San Miel. And being able to fight that one battle, plus fight in the Meuse-Argonne, which was going to be part of a combined offensive um, effort beginning towards the end of September, was extremely difficult. But Pershing was adamant again about this. Um, some uh, you know, officers called him obstinate. But I feel like he, he had the Americans' best interest in this, and it was up to him to make these decisions. Samiel is attacked on September 12th. Uh, the Germans were somewhat aware of the Americans in the area and the potential for an offensive. They had begun a withdrawal, but they hadn't completely withdrawn from the salient. The Americans attacked about 500,000 troops and completely overwhelmed the Germans, liberated the area, and French citizens who had been basically isolated by the Germans uh, for almost four years, living in cellars, having to give away uh, their homes, give away their, their, their farmland, uh, their goods, their cattle, all of their supplies and things were finally brought back. And you can see from this image, and by the way, most of the images I'm going to show you today that you've seen already are from the holdings of the archives in our Signal Corps collection, which is a wonderful collection in the process of being digitized. So Samuel takes place from the 15th. Uh, speaking of birthdays, Pershing had his birthday on September 13th. He had turned 58, and it was a great present for him. But there wasn't time to gloat over the battle. They had to start preparing for the attack on the Meuse-Argonne front. 
Pershing moved his headquarters from one part of France to um, Suyi, uh, a little village. I'll show you that in a moment. But I wanted to show you an image. He traveled around by his own personal train. He wasn't the only one. Almost all the commanders had their trains. Uh, you notice some of the um, African Americans here. They were actually uh, former Pullman porters who um, were recruited by the army. And it was a full uh, train. It had an office in there. It had um, a sleeper car. It had a kitchen. And he had maps of the front and so forth. So he moves his headquarters to the mayor's um, uh, department here, the mayor's building here in Suyi. You can still see it today. It's, it's well marked. The, um, the French had used this during the Battle of Verdun a couple of years ago. You could go in the building. The steps are worn out, wooden. You could imagine the number of French officers going all the way to the top where the, the office is. So they're starting to plan this battle. And they've got to figure out, how are we going to get all these American troops towards the front, where mostly British troops, I'm sorry, French troops are, and get them in line. And the person who orchestrates this, who's one of the unsung heroes of the war, we hear a lot about him, of course, during the Second World War, and then later on during the rebuilding of Europe, and that's George C. Marshall. Uh, the VMI graduate um, entered the service, served in the 1st Division as an operations officer, did a wonderful job in one of the first American battles at Contini. He was brought in by Pershing to be on his staff and eventually brought over the 1st Army. It was really up to Marshall to do the planning, and somehow he was able to manage to get um, more than 500,000 troops brought in at night traveling along roads and bring them to the front to prepare for an attack which had now been set for the early morning hours of September 26 of 1918. Many of the troops were brought forward by um, French Indo-Chinese uh, drivers. They were uh, recruited again by the French, brought the Americans in who, um, and, and keep in mind many of the um, Americans hadn't been out of their home, hometowns, much less traveled to France and and were amazed at these drivers. Um, some of them thought that they were Chinese, but they often wrote about their experiences and how rough it was driving to the front. But sure enough, they get there in a few days. The Germans have no idea that the Americans are going to attack. They know the Americans are in the area. They're flying planes over, and they can see that um, more and more American troops, doughboys as we call them, are, are forming for some kind of operation. But the Germans don't know exactly when it's going to take place and where. But um, 5.30, around, I'm sorry, 3.30 in the morning, the artillery kicks off. More than 1,000 guns, um, French guns, 75 millimeter, 155 millimeter, start firing towards the German positions. A few hours later, what they called in World War I, the American troops jumped off. Most of them were not in trenches. We think about trenches in the First World War. They were actually out in the open, either in forested areas or hunkered down in uh, former shell holes. But the battle commences, and it moves forward, and it moves forward rapidly. The American troops make great gains on the first day. One of the key landmarks is uh, Monfucon, Falcon Mountain in English. It's a high ground. The Germans have observation posts there. And they've had posts there since 1914. They can see where the troops are coming. And it's a key post to take out early in the battle. Pershing wants it done the first day. The French tell him he's crazy. It may take until Christmas. But the attack happens in that area. And the Americans make some gains, but they're driven back. It's not until the second day that one of the regiments from Maryland, actually from Baltimore, the 313th, part of the 79th Division, capture Mafukan and drive the Germans from that post. Meanwhile, as the battle plays out, it starts to bog down. And part of the problem with the battle, and any World War I battle for that matter, is communication. Uh, they used wireless, but there were also wires laid by uh, the Signal Corps uh, troops who would move them forward, but they were easy targets for the Germans. And in order to get messages forward, we need a clear communication. I mentioned Marshall being an unsung um, hero of the battle. Certainly, the telephone operators, also known as Hello Girls, um, did, were a key to any success with uh, the American operation. They were recruited by the Bell companies um, as the war commenced. And um, one of the um, 
um, attributions is they had to speak French and they had to be able to handle kind of pressure behind the lines. And they were mostly in Suyi, which was close to the front. You could see behind their chairs that they have the army issued uh, doughboy helmets, plus in the bag gas masks, because you never knew when an attack was going to happen. And they, they served quite well, and at the end of the war, Pershing had commended them as true soldiers of the army. Another problem, we often bemoan about the traffic issues here in the Washington area. Well, certainly it was a problem over there. There were only three roads leading to the front, most of which had been pummeled by the Germans through their artillery throughout the past four years. Plus, once the battle uh, commenced, they started aiming their artillery onto these roads. If you've been to northern France in the autumn, you know it rains there quite a bit. It's damp, so the roads would puddle up. The engineers would have to go out and try and replace um, the hulls, cover them over using log stones or whatever they could find. But what happens is there's major congestion, which means supplies are not getting to the front, which includes food and water, medical supplies, but also armaments. And it becomes a huge problem, and slowly the battle starts to really bog down to the point of the Americans aren't making any gains and there's significant amount of pressure put on Pershing. Perhaps maybe he's not the guy to lead the Americans. Maybe he doesn't understand the logistics. And the French and British are pressuring him to step down and allow one of their commanders to take over. They're threatening President Wilson that, Wil that Pershing needs to go, uh, but Wilson stands behind him. But as the battle goes on and the pressure and Pershing's going to the front, constantly talking to his troops, trying to push them on. He's relieving commanders. He was the ultimate micromanager. Um, I mentioned some of the documents here at NARA that he created. And often you'd see his, his signatures in the marginalia. Well, he would go to the front. If he felt like one of his officers wasn't performing, he'd fire them. He'd either send them to one of the rear areas, or some of them, in a case, were shipped home. But the pressure was getting to him significantly. On one of his trips to the front, um, his aide, uh, Major Quickmire, was in the front seat, and he heard his boss bemoan behind him in the car, Frankie, Frankie, oh my god, what am I doing? This isn't going well. And he was calling out his deceased wife's name, and he basically was almost having a nervous breakdown. But he pulled himself together, he regrouped, and when he had formed First Army, he was still commanding the entire American Army, which was known as the American Expeditionary Forces. He decided at this point he was going to step down as the commander of First Army, and in his place he appointed one of his brilliant com corps commanders, a guy named um, Hunter Liggett. And this allowed Pershing a little bit more um, lenience in the sense of how he was running things. But again, going back to the micromanager theme, that train I showed you, he had it parked near Suyi. So poor Liggett, even though he was commanding First Army, Pershing was a mainstay in the headquarters there and absolutely badgering him all the time. When Pershing wasn't around the Meuse-Argonne front, he was often in Paris, a uh, home that he was allowed to use by Ogden Mills. But he had another reason for going to Paris, and that was a young woman who uh, was 23 years old when they met in 1917. Her name was Micheline Resco. She was a Romanian artist. They met at a, a party. She was um, commissioned to do a portrait of Pershing, which she had done with another um, number of other officers. And they hit it off and uh, developed a ro romantic relationship, which actually lasted until Pershing's death in the late 1940s. Um, previous authors have called her um, his mistress, which in my mind is not really true. She was not married. He was widowed. He certainly had the right to, um, to date and, and have a, a companion. Um, he was, um, I think, pretty embarrassed by the significant age difference of more than 30-some years. And he didn't talk about it very much. But it was the worst kept secret within the Army. Almost everybody knew about Pershing and uh, Micheline Resco. As the battle progresses and Hunt Liggett takes place, takes over, um, he's got a number of things he has to deal with. Straggling is a huge issue. We think of straggling maybe troops who didn't want to fight anymore. But the bottom line is fighting in that area, especially in the dense Argonne Forest, troops often got lost from their units. And so he had the, the um, military police come in 
and gather them up and bring them back to their units, but also getting supplies forward. You know, animals were used um, to, as you can see, the roads themselves are, are, are hard, uh, muddy often from the rain, and so they found different ways to bring um, supplies to the front, and slowly things progressed, but also Lincoln had to deal with something that nobody expected, and that was the influenza epidemic. It was, by October, it was in its second phase, the first in, in the summer, and now is even more devastating. Hundreds of thousands of troops on all sides were impacted, especially First Army. It was first believed to be pneumonia, and then later it was determined that it was um, the flu. So we had to deal with the, um, the, the sick and also the injured soldiers. And many of them were brought to field hospitals close to the front where they were treated. If their um, wounds were more serious, they were brought back and um, taken to general hospitals. Those caring for them were nurse, nurses who volunteered either with the Army Nurse Corps or the Red Cross. And it was treacherous duty. They were often at the front working long hours. You know, we like to say today, you know, 24-7. They certainly were working that. It was dangerous situations. Two of them, the Cromwell sisters, Gladys and Dorothy, for were from a, a wealthy New York family. They joined up, um, served in one of the uh, hospitals towards the front, and it was a horrific experience for them. They had seen many, many mangled men, young boys. They had witnessed death. When the war was over and they finally returned home to France, they were on one of the ships heading back in early 1919. They must have made a pact because as the ship um, was leaving France and heading into the Atlantic, they went on uh, the first deck of the ship and jumped over and committed suicide. One of the mainstays of the, the Army, which was part of the American Expedition, Expeditionary Forces, not an independent arm like it is today, was the Air Service. That was led by the gentleman in the far left, um, Colonel Billy Mitchell, who was promoted to Brigadier General, a very competent officer who really built the Air Service. Problem was, because the weather was so poor throughout the battle that the, the, Air, the Air Corps didn't have as much impact as it had wanted. During Saint Miel, there were more than 1,000 planes that got airborne when the weather was a little bit better. During the Meuse Argonne, during the 47 days, there were only about 800. Many of them had to leave later in the day because of uh, the, the heavy clouds. Um, one of the heroes of the war is the uh, officer standing by the, wrecked, uh, the wreckage, the German wreckage, and that's Frank Luke. He was known as a balloon buster. The Germans would launch these balloon sausages, as they called them. And his job was to get close to them, even though the balloons were heavily protected by anti-aircraft fire below, and shoot them down. He had 18 victories leading up until the second day of the Meuse-Argonne, and then on September 27th, he was shot down and killed. In the far uh, left corner underneath uh, Billy Mitchell is, of course, Eddie Rickenmacher from the famous 94th Aero Squadron. He was the uh, American ace of the war, having 26 victories. Another gentleman here um, underneath Frank Luke, you may not be as familiar with. His name is Marion Cooper. And Cooper, like a lot of young men, joined up early. He actually was at the Naval Academy in Annapolis, didn't do too well there, was booted out, joined the National Guard, wanted some um, kind of adventure, joined the Air Service, even though it was incredibly dangerous, and took off on the first day of the Meuse-Argonne. His plane was shot down. He was held in captivity throughout the war. After the war, he gets out. He actually is responsible for finding the remains of Frank Luke. He goes on after World War I and joins the Polish Air Force. But more famously, many years later, he became the director of King Kong, and he was um, also a well-known cinematographer. Other heroes that you may already know about that, that at least deserve a, a prominent role in the book, of course, George C. Um, George S. Patton. He um, was started out as a driver, um, actually on Pershing's crew. He came over um, as a um, uh, one of his aides. He ends up um, in the tank corps, a new fledgling arm of the service. On the first day of the battle, he's attacking in support 
of the unit to the far right with the guy on the horse, and that's Harry S. Truman. He was a ba battery commander in an artillery unit of the 35th Division. Um, Patton support, they're um, uh, fighting in an area near Sheppey um, towards the front, and Patton is shot through the thigh, badly wounded, and he's out of the battle for um, the remainder of the war. In the middle, of course, is Douglas MacArthur, who ended up becoming a brigadier general in the 42nd, the Rainbow Division. Quite a character, um, a long-time service, West Point graduate. He was also the highest decorated officer in the First World War, eventually winning seven Silver Stars and um, Distinguished Service Crosses. The battle commences through um, Liggett's leadership the Americans are, are able to overwhelm the Germans, break through their lines, break through the wire, um, get around these machine gun nests, which are devastating the American troops. And because the Germans recognize that the battle is not going well, by um, the third week, in, or by about three quarters way into the battle, there are more than a million Americans fighting, along with about 300,000 French. There are another... Um, million or so um, Americans who are ready to come over to the U.S. if shipping is available. It's pretty much the end of the road for the Germans. Behind the scenes negotiating takes place and an armistice is called for on um, November 11th at 11 a.m. on 1918. Because the Allies and uh, the Americans and the French and even the British feared that the Germans might renege on this armistice. The fighting took place all the way up until 11 a.m. So we had American casualties who were killed right up to that last minute. After the war, um, Hunter Liggett was brought before Congress and drilled about why the war continued on. But the obvious reason was it was only an armistice. And keep in mind, that's not a surrender. It just means we're stopping the war for right now to negotiate some sort of surrender. But the armistice does take place at that appointed time, and the battle winds down. And the war winds down. And the reason, again, that the war winds down is because of this 47-day battle. And it's because the Americans came in. It's because Pershing was adamant that the Americans fight as an independent force. And when the, the, the battle ends and the histories are starting to be written, um, there's some question about what the American role was. And certainly, American bloodshed over in the Meuse-Argonne was significant. And you had heroes all of a sudden that came out um, through the news media. Sam Woodfill in the 5th Division, who um, defeated um, a small group of Germans on his own in a, in a machine gun nest. Um, Charles Whittlesey, who led the so-called Lost Battalion, a, a group of soldiers from the 77th Division that were neither lost or an entirely a battalion, but they were caught in the Oregon Forest. They were trapped there. Um, the Americans uh, knew where they were, and they fought for over um, six days to rescue them. Part of the rescue took place in another part of the Oregon, the 82nd Division, and a guy named Alvin York, who was a corporal later promoted to sergeant, helped fight the Germans. He ended up capturing more than 100 Germans single-handedly, and his story became synonymous with the Meuse-Argonne and the First World War. Um, when the fighting had ended, as I mentioned, there's more than a million Americans, but their accomplishment was significant. They captured more than 2,400 German guns. Um, they had fired um, more than four, 4 million of their own shells. As I mentioned, 840 um, planes. Um, they also took more than um, 16,000 German POWs and had penetrated more than 34 miles. And over those 47 days, they also uh, recaptured something like 150 French villages. Unfortunately, many of them were now inhabitable, but were later rebuilt through the help of um, American money that had come over um, after the war. But it was a heavy cost for the Americans and for General Pershing. Um, more than 120,000 warriors were killed and wounded. Roughly about 26,000 of those had died either from combat or from the influenza. For the Germans, the exact number of their belligerents is roughly around 450,000 with about 28,000 killed, another 100,000 um, are wounded. Many of the Americans who were killed there, more than 14,000 are um, 
laid to rest in the Meuse Argon Cemetery, which is actually the largest cemetery of the American Battle Monuments Commission um, burial sites um, overseas. We often think about Normandy, which um, has greater acclaim, but uh, Meuse Argon is the larger cemetery. It's certainly not a reason to brag, but, it's, but it shows just the sacrifice that these men made, and there are women buried there as well. So to sum up the battle, again, this was General Pershing's battle. This was his to fight, essentially his to lose. But he led the American troops ably, and without the American warriors, this battle would not have taken place. It's, it's easy to say that perhaps the war might have gone on far into 1919 with more significant bloodshed. Thank you for your time and attention. And I'll be happy to take any questions. Were the, um, were the Pershing boots that much of an improvement? I have three questions. And then could you say that he invented the military police or did he um, reinvent them? And were the Americans assigned that section of the front because the terrain was so rugged in, in case the enemy broke through, they couldn't advance as far, as fast? Well, I wasn't sure about your first question about the, the Pershing boots, but um, as far as the um, military police, to the best of my knowledge, this is the first time that uh, military police were used by the American Army. Of course, a lot of what we learned um, was through the British and the French. They had their own you know, law enforcement within the military, and they played a significant role. And, and your question kind of brings up one uh, other point, is when we look at the photographs of American troops in their uniforms overseas. We look at the motion pictures and um, from the Signal Corps collection here at the archives. It kind of looks archaic, it, it, but it, in the truth of the matter is this was the modern age of warfare. And it hadn't been for the Americans learning how to fight on the Meuse-Argon front, we wouldn't have been the army that we became in World War II and become the superpower later on and become a predominant military today. Um, and as far as your, your question about um, the, the sector, that's a good question. And this is something that Pershing had negotiated with, with the French. He wanted an area where the Americans could have some prominence and make an impact. And he had had his eye on the Meuse-Argonne front even before he came over to France. Of course, he was a student of military history. He knew that that area was significant, largely because um, it was also a big supply route. And there were rail lines that were feeding into the Western Front. And so he really encouraged Foch to give the Americans that front, not because he knew it was the toughest, but he felt like it was going to make the most impact. Yes, uh, you mentioned that there was intense negotiation between uh, Persian and French generals regarding the use of, of troops. Um, as you know, uh, black troops of the 92nd and 93rd were transferred to the 157th uh, French unit. I'd like to know the decision behind that because I, as you know, um, Persians served with a black unit, the 10th Cavalry, and the, the treatment of black troops, particularly combat troops in in, in World War I was horrendous. And I'm just also curious to know why wasn't the 9th and 10th Cavalry transferred to Europe? I mean, why they were basically segregated and just remained on the, uh, in, the, in, the, um, in the western part of the country. I mean, those were elite units, but mm -hmm. they never got to serve in Europe. So I basically just have two questions okay. there. Okay, it's an excellent question. There were more than 200,000 African Americans who served with the American Expeditionary Forces overseas. Um, unfortunately, as you point out, you know, many of them who were, had experience in fighting uh, either with the regular troops in the US, the 9th and 10th Cavalry, were put into basically support roles. Many of them were stevedores um, unloading the ships at the docks, or they were um, laborers um, building the roads. Um, building um, army facilities. But there were the two divisions, the 92nd Division, which you mentioned, which was an entire division. And then there was the 93rd, which was a provisional division. And you would have thought that Pershing, having commanded African-American troops, would have welcomed them. But he didn't. And, and the, the answer is not entirely clear, other than the fact that the military was segregated at the time. He followed the protocol of the military. 
how the um, African-American troops ended up with the French. The 92nd were attached to the French and actually fought to the left of uh, the Americans in the Meuse-Argonne. The 93rd uh, fought in a different um, sector. But when the negotiations and the French were hammering Pershing to get American troops, he said, OK, well, I'm not going to give you some of my um, white combat units, but I will give you the African-American troops. And the French were glad to take them. They had their own um, African uh, Corps troops, so they were used to dealing with um, African soldiers. And the African-American troops fought extremely well. Uh, the 92nd Division, unfortunately, had a share of problems, mostly because of poor leadership. But the troops themselves fought extremely well. The um, 93rd Division, the Provisional Division, had the 369th, the Harlem Hellfighters, the Harlem Rattlers, which are also called. They were in line more than any other American unit during the war. So uh, to sum up the answer to your question, it's not entirely clear why Pershing didn't push for African American troops, other than the fact that he kept the Army segregated. And I think that was a mistake. Yes, sir. Yes, I have a question related to the, uh, the training of the officer corps and, and all of the different units and, of course, the different uh, branches of the army. Uh, when Pershing arrived, or even before he arrived in France, did he uh, realize there was a need for reforming much of the army, you know, in terms of schooling and preparing these, the forces to, to, you know, to be in places like France or in an expeditionary force, whereas uh, the army, you know, never been that large before? And, was facing those unique challenges. So did, in, in his mind, was he working on that already when he arrived in France? Because he really didn't know how long the war would go. Um, he absolutely was. In fact, um, he established schools, almost like universities, to train officers in various um, things, such as intelligence and uh, logistics, supplies, and so forth. And the officers were sent to these schools. In fact, some of the schools were going on on the eve of the attack on September 26, and there were a number of officers that weren't even available to lead their units. So he was well aware that many of the, the young officers who didn't have the experience he had in the Philippines and during the Spanish-American War were going to need specialized training. And that's really where our allies stepped up to help us. The, British and the French were the primary instructors of, of our um, officers. Many of them, unfortunately, were not very good. And as I mentioned before, he called out the ones that he thought were, were poor officers, either lazy or didn't have the ability, the strength to lead the troops. And um, he dismissed them. Hi, Connie. Aside from the records of the Signal Corps, what other records did you use both at the National Archives and in other repositories? Well, I mean, the, the, as one historian is called okay. the National Archives, it is the mother's milk for military history. And certainly the records here are far greater than any other to document um, the AEF and the American Expeditionary Forces and the Muse are gone. But I also spent some time um, up at um, Carlisle at the Military um, History Institute there where they had the personal papers of um, Donovan and one of the other key officers, Hugh Drum, plus a number of other um, of, uh, of staff officers, plus they had these questionnaires. Um, th those are the two key areas. I also went down to, um, to where VMI is in Lexington and looked at uh, George C. Marshall's papers. And without writing the story uh, on Pershing, you, have, you, you can't write the story without looking at his papers. And so I spent a fair amount of time with our friends at the Library of Congress looking at Pershing's papers and Billy Mitchell's and so forth. So those were the, the key areas I spent and a few other repositories that I was able to sneak in. Yes, sir. Uh, three questions. Uh, one, did Pershing himself came up with his, come up with his famous line, Lafayette, we are here? Or is that some speechwriter's uh, invention? Uh, secondly, what happened to his uh, female <coughs> companion after his death, was he, was he given any kind of recognition or, or a, a compensation, whatever? And then third, uh, Pershing's grave site at Arlington Cemetery is quite moving. He, I, I assume he himself dictated he just wanted this simple soldier's headstone. Uh, but uh, somebody made the decision to give it a whole lot of space by itself. So I just wanted to know, and the only other grave nearby is for his grandson. So I just wanted to know how that came about. Okay, uh, the first question, no, it was one of his aides who said uh, Lafayette were here. Uh, Pershing didn't, didn't think of that, but it was a tribute and it was, 
his, his way of showing that the French that were here to, um, to um, absolutely um, support you and, um, and that we, you know, we are here like Lafayette was during the American um, Revolution to support the colonists in our rebellion um, against um, the British. I, I think I lost you on the second question. What happened to the female companion? All right, Micheline Resco. Well, he remained with her, but they had a, what we would call a long distance relationship. She stayed back in France. He came back to the US, mostly lived here in Washington. But he became chairman of the American Battle Monuments Commission, and his work took him over where they were constructing the uh, cemeteries and putting up memorials. So he would see her there. They had a lengthy correspondence, which is another place I did some research. Um, their letters were collected by one of Pershing's previous biographers, uh, Father Donald Smythe. Um, and there at the uh, Catholic Archdiocese archives in St. Louis. And you could see the communication between the two of them. And they were deeply in love, but Pershing had his business here and she had her business over in France. He did bring her over to the US in the 1920s. She set up a gallery in New York for a short period. I don't believe it was very successful and went back to France. However, when World War II broke out in 1939, um, he brought her back to the U.S. Uh, along with her mother. They lived in, in what's now the Shoreham Wardman Hotel off of Connecticut Avenue. They had an apartment there. Um, at this point, Pershing was pretty sick. He was um, getting uh, on in age and had a number of illnesses. He had his own suite at Walter Reed. She would come visit him there. And towards the end of his life, they did get married. They brought a priest into the suite, and um, he officiated their marriage. Uh, when he passed away, he left her a significant amount of money through his remaining son, or remaining child, Warren, who was an investment banker. And I've seen the um, insurance annuities. Um, Micheline was well taken care of. And then that leads to your, your third question. Um, Warren had a, a couple of sons, one of them, Richard, who was killed in the Vietnam War. Um, Pershing did ask to have a simple soldier's burial on a plot at Arlington Cemetery. And when Richard was killed, uh, during the war, he was brought there, and they um, faced each other on that hill. And it is a, a fairly significant area, um, but also not far from there is the last um, American um, who was served in World War I, Frank Buckles. So it's almost become kind of a tribute to World War I in that area. I, you almost took my question away, but just um, it has to do with the end of Pershing's life. Um, and that, uh, in relation to his uh, um, comments uh, to Eisenhower or others when he realized that they were going to have to refight the, essentially the same war, and he hadn't been a participant, I don't believe, at the Treaty of Versailles, um, did he ever make any uh, comments to Eisenhower or anybody else uh, as the Second World War began to open up in terms of how he saw the you know, the effort in World War I? Absolutely. In fact, all of the um, general officers from Omar Bradley to Patton to Eisenhower all visited um, Pershing at his suite at Walter Reed. Um, it said that Patton got down on his knees and kissed um, Pershing West Point ring. And they, they kind of wanted, you know, his, his words of wisdom before they left to go overseas in the, in the case of um, early in the war was North Africa and then eventually Eisenhower, of course, the liberation of, of Europe. So yeah, Pershing, even though he was um, of age, um, he was well aware of what was going on. I think he tried to give some advice to FDR who politely listened, but he was a, a soldier of a, of a different age and had he been you know, perhaps younger, it's, it's hard to say whether he would have had a role in the Second World War. But certainly the, the key officers there um, recognized that if it, if it wasn't for Pershing, they wouldn't be in the situation they were in. Yes? Earlier in his career, when he was dealing with African Americans and then some missions to, to deal with Native Americans uh, and also Filipinos, was he identified as... Uh, oh, he's good at dealing with diverse populations that maybe the other officers weren't. Absolutely. That's an excellent point. And I talk a little bit about that. For example, um, the Moros, who um, 
were not happy at all about having Americans in the Philippines. After all, they had you know, rebelled against the Spanish rule for hundreds of years, the Spanish-American War, drove the Spanish away, and next thing you know, the Americans are there, and the Moros um, were very defiant. But Pershing was able to use, unfortunately, a little bit of um, you know, combat, but along with a lot of perseverance and diplomatic um, uh, talking to get the Moros to, to pacify them. And that became one of his strengths. And, and by the way, there's been recent comments in the news by a, a certain presidential candidate who claimed that Pershing had helped pacify the Moros by dipping uh, the American bullets in uh, pig blood because, the, of course, the Moros are, are Muslim. There's no truth to that uh, whatsoever. <laughs> yes, sir. Did <clears throat> Did he use the knowledge of the American Civil War, namely, namely the experience of General Grant? He worshiped General Grant. Um, Grant was his hero. He had studied the Civil War battles, and especially the, the wilderness, which is somewhat like the Meuse Argonne, the same sort of terrain in um, Virginia. So he was definitely well aware of the Civil War battles. That, and, and he was even criticized in some ways for that because of the fact that he was throwing you know, American men against these strong German defenses, which the American Civil War showed, like at Gettysburg, Fredericksburg, Petersburg, never exactly worked. But Pershing's idea was to fight the so-called open warfare out of the trenches. And that was the only way that the Americans were going to persevere and bring this long war to a close. Um, the Bonus Army March of 1932. Yes. Uh, of course, MacArthur led the troops uh, with his aid Eisenhower to roust the bonus marchers. Of course, there's a famous story of Patton. The guy who saved Patton in World War I was Patton ignored him. He was one of the bonus marchers. My question is, did, uh, uh, did anyone consult, did Pershing ever say anything about the, about the bonus army when it was going on? Did anyone talk to him? Did he have any reflections upon it? That's a good question. I've never seen anything. I did some research on that for a previous book on Douglas MacArthur and certainly know that Eisenhower was adamant against it. But as far as um, Pershing, I never saw any comments. Um, if he did make them, they were behind the scenes. Uh, but I've never seen anything publicly where he, um, he couldn't have been happy about it, I'm sure. I mean, these were the same, you know, doughboys, American troops that had um, fought together on the battlefields in France. And here was the American army where, you know, MacArthur foolishly, you know, basically attacking them. So including, I've never including seen tear gas, ironically, and he used tear gas, and it was an embarrassment, and it, it literally, I think, cost uh, President Hoover re-election. But I've never seen Pershing any comments from Pershing about it. Okay, I'm told we're out of time, which I guess is a good thing. Um, there are books for sale that I'll be happy to sign for you up in the bookshop. But thank you again for coming out. I really appreciate it. <laughs>